Look at all these people in here. I almost feel like it's dinner time. Except it, it doesn't smell as good as when it's dinner time. So how are you all doing tonight? Okay. How are you all doing tonight? That's exactly what I wanted to hear. Um, welcome to Open Mic at the Pines. We're all so excited about this. Are you excited? Okay. Good, good. We're all on the same page then. First, um, first on our agenda are some special announcements by Mark Boyd. Um, hello, everybody. Um, I just let's give, want. Let's give you a mic. Let's give me a mic. Yeah, because it's it's crowded. Hey there. Hey y'all. <laughs> um, thanks everybody for coming out tonight. I do want to let everybody know we are live streaming this. It is live on the internet and it is worldwide. And we're live now and we already have people from Mexico, uh, British Columbia, all over the United States. Uh, it's a little bit late for the European folks to tune in, but we'll usually pick one or two of them up. And uh, so I expect everybody to represent well, and let's show them what our little part of the world could do. Well, in that case, hello world. <laughs> and those of you European insomniacs, we're not going to forget about you. Welcome to Penland, North Carolina. Um, I'm just going to, yeah, Kate is a slow. Um, she's going to say hello again with some songs later. So. Just to reiterate, in case uh, you didn't hear me run in my mouth before, uh, my name is Stephanie, and I have the sign-up sheet. So if you are even thinking about performing, even if you're not too sure, come talk to me. We will get you on the list, or we will talk about getting you on the list. I'm really good at talking about stuff. And, um, and then Kata will tell you that you have to just go ahead and get on the list. Um, she even has a song dedicated to not being scared of performing at open mic which is pretty cool. So I'm just going to open with a couple songs. I'm going to do this without sound. So um, that'll be an experiment. And then um, we're going we're gonna to get going. I'm going to announce the next person afterwards. I left my list over there. I'll switch it professionally. Who is it? <laughs> yeah. So Rebecca, you're going to be after me. Hey. 
taking over his host. I just thought that uh, I should step in and provide some context. So Rebecca is a high school student that uh, one of the many, all my high school students make some noise right now. All right, so if you were wondering, these new faces right here, these camouflage hats, these green shoes, these are all uh, Mitchell High School students that have been uh, developing poetry all week. Um, and wasn't that such a lovely piece of poetry yeah. that she just read? <laughs> so we're going to be hearing from a lot of student poets today. And, and there are a couple of, uh, there's some etiquette, there's some spoken word etiquette that um, we should all be aware of. Okay, so 
uh, a popular thing we say at, at spoken word open mic events is poetry is not like golf. You don't have to wait to the end to be like, <laughs> okay? During the poem, as they're, you know, as they're spitting these lyrics, as they're bearing their souls, uh, you might have heard Stacy and I do it. One way that we show love is to snap our fingers. Let me hear y'all snap one time. Okay, so if you hear a metaphor that you think is, is really interesting or, she, or he or she says a line that's really moving, I want you to snap your fingers. You can also like, mm, or like, whew. You know, you, and the, we just want to do things that are a little quiet so that, that you can still hear the, the next line that's being said. As soon as she's done, that's when we're like, ah! you know, we go crazy at the end of the poem, but during the poem, we snap our fingers. Cool? Okay, cool. All right. Uh, so I, I think that, that context is important, and um, we'll be hearing from a lot of students today, so show them your love and your, and your support. Uh, oh. Make some noise, the next poet up to the mic today for Hope. One more thing. I'm so sorry. No, no, he just reminded me. Before a poet spits, we say, Go in, poet! Go in, poet! Go in, poet! Go in, poet! Don't give up! Thank you. Um, creativity and uniqueness surging through my ready hands. Sketches of Batman and silly doodles of my teachers. I start to sketch I start to sketch with graphite pencils and an easel. I bring in pens and pastels, colored pencils and some watercolor. A paper filled with silliness and matches. <laughs> a paper filled with silliness and imagination. Collages of photography and cameras floating all around my room. I'm going to this song for a drawing and painting studio. What do you say? Yeah, I think, I think there's room for her in D&D. Let's get her up here. Up next, we have um, a special song from our friend Kada. And Kada and I are going to be a team today. I'm going to hold the microphone and she's going to sing. You ready? Let's welcome Kada up to the stage. <laughs> after after Kada, we'll be rolling in an indigo just to give you a little bit of a heads up. Are you ready? Okay, she's ready. It's a princess city where the girls are so pretty. I first set my eyes on sweet my Malone. We are we bewildered through sweet for the narrow crying of girls in my soul. Oh. A lot of eyes are full. 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 Crying, cuckoo, and my soul. A lot of eyes are full. A lot of eyes are full. She was a fishmonger. Short was no wonder. So was her father and mother before. They eat real, they wheel, they wool. Food, 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 and they will cry in. Cuckold and muscles. Alive, alive, alive. Alive, 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 Oh, <laughs> 
in my soul. Alive, 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 alive. Crying cockles in my soul. and Kata, we're going to start rewriting that song about Molly Spadone. And, and I think it's, instead of dying, she's going to get superpowers. So um, stay tuned. That'll, that'll be happening eventually. So uh, Miss Lillian and Miss Indigo, they're somewhere behind me, right? Y'all need some chairs? Or is it, you can, they can sit on the couch. Okay, well, they're getting ready. Let's have a huge, big old welcome for Lillian and Indigo. And once again, if you would like to sign up, um, please come see me. I have the magical sheet and the magical pen. And it's, um, it's a special pen. When you write your name with it, you suddenly don't have the jitters anymore. I swear. It comes with Molly's widow and superpowers. <laughs>
those here. I really like impromptu sing along. They're super fun. Are you guys, are you leaving? Let's have another hand for these two. Do not stop writing, ladies. Do not stop writing. So next we have one of our one of our own Penland core students. Um, usually we see her. Wait, all of you? I don't know what you guys are doing. I just know that Molly's name's on the list. Molly and some other folks. Who's the rest? Sarah Brown, Alfred Dell, Megan Morton, and Sarah and Andy. Oh man! Let's go! Let's go! Let's go! And, um, and you girls are about to rock your world, so uh, get excited. <laughs> and after that, we're gonna um, we're gonna have our um, our very own Mitchell High teacher, Melora. So um, get ready, honey. Here's the hot sauce.
Wow. I mean, we know that they can make stuff, but we don't even hear them sing a lot. That was really great. Thanks, ladies. Thanks so much. Um, up next, we have Melora. She's one of our very own Mitchell High students, or students. She's a teacher. She was young enough to be a student, though. I mean, I, yeah. Um, let's, let's, we love Mitchell High. We love Mitchell High. Yeah. Let's give her a huge hand. provided all my physical needs, food, a warm house, toys, but this world was often clouded by my father's drunken rages and shards of broken bones and harsh words would rain down, slicing my heart in two. I spent most of my childhood outdoors where a warm summer's breeze offered heated hugs and the leaves of fall lifted my spirit with their amazing acrobatics. I still find solace in open spaces away from the constraints of four walls. On any day, once I've had my mother's inspection, ears swabbed, check, <laughs> shoes tied, check, underwear clean, mom. I would bolt from the house like a militant bullet trained on its prey and land right in the middle of our swamp. It was near the cellar where a shriveled old witch was in prison waiting to snatch me up if I came too close. This is the swamp where my chickens wore suits of armor and devoured the evil grubs who tried to tunnel into my castle. This is the swamp where my trusted guards, clad in fur coats, patrolled the forest with their yellow-green eyes. You see, during this time of my life, I was Snow White, and my animals were my faithful confidants. We fought brave battles. We won the admiration of all the kingdoms, and we flew through the air. Yes, I could fly. I just knew I had been ripped from my real world and been placed here with these mortal parents. So I spent years desperately searching for doors that would lead me back to my kingdom. As time slowly crept by, my parents' raging battles escalated. We moved to a more isolated area and my days of make-believe were over, or so I thought. While walking through the woods, I suddenly realized the laurel thickets resembled small cottages. The soldier trees watched over these tiny villages while fairies fluttered through the air. Here in this magical realm, I could crawl into my real home and host tea parties where all the animals fought to get an invitation. Soon, I began to bring elements of my other world to my real home. My fuzzy blanket served as my magic carpet, my wings, and my protective shield. My mother never could understand how such a small girl could get a blanket so dirty. When she would take my blankie to the washer, he had adventures of his own as Kid the Pirate braving the rough seas. My cat soon evolved into servants, friends, or evil elves. Every time my mother would call me in, tears would flow like waterfalls from my eyes. How could I leave my world behind? Now a realm of this magnitude and power was not to be content to be visited only once or twice a day. Soon, my new acquaintances began to follow me home. They lurked behind the trees and slipped through the door when no one was looking. The lion and the tin man guarded the door to my room so my father's anger would not reach me. As I dove under the covers, the lid of Oscar's trash can would close behind me and I was safe. Soon, my mother would become worried. I began asking, Mom, when I say lizard leaping or lollipop, why doesn't a giant letter L fall from the sky? Mom, why does lightning not flash and thunder not roll when I go, Mom? Two, three, ah, 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 ah. Mom, can we please leave here? 
I can tell you how to get to Sesame Street. <laughs> I quickly learned that the word mental did not mean I was intelligent. <laughs> and Looney Bin was not an after school play place. <laughs> my mother began to use these words with such force that my friends and I decided to keep our foolishness a secret. As the eons progressed, I made my parents proud. I earned a bachelor's degree, eventually a master's, and became a responsible adult. I raised two children on my own, I paid bills, I need glasses, <laughs> and I grew old. But in the real world, <laughs> I cast spells with Harry Potter, I roamed the halls of Hogwarts, I hunt my enemies with Katniss Everdeen, and I speak to the dead. I hide in the ways with the merfolk, I rule over England as a princess, I shoot fire from my fingers, and I fly around the moon at night. I tightly hold Jay Gatsby's hand as we reach for the fleeting green light at the end of the dock, searching for a happiness that does not exist. My mind is an external vortex, is an internal vortex. Characters, places, scenarios swirl and intertwine. The Death Star fires its torpedoes. No one normal thinks like you. Life is not one of your stories. My force fills up. The Millennium Falcon always finds its way. When I left you, I was but the learner. Now I'm the master. <laughs> for the 11th graders that, that I was in a third and fourth block, 11th grade class, and there's a picture of Han Solo and Princess Leia with her face and her husband's face superimposed. <laughs> so when she says, my force field is up, like, I'm totally with you. Really um, so yeah, I've been, I've been really uh, honored uh, to be here uh, for the past few uh, weeks. Or sorry, for the past week, uh, several days, the past few days, working with these wonderful 11th grade students that you see here. Can we give them another round of applause? Yeah. Please? Thank you. And I think we'll hear a few more of them spit over the course of the night. I hope. Okay. <laughs> They're like <laughs> trying to avoid my gaze. They get extra credit to be here, by the way. Um, <laughs> but um. Uh, Stacy, I'd like to thank you and Penland for inviting me here to do the residency, and, and I love hearing the voices of the actual Penland students as well. Uh, I'm going to open with the piece that I was um, that I wrote for Penland. Uh, I came here uh, probably two years ago for the first time, and I think it's so beautiful here and it's very inspiring. So um, I've actually I've written pieces about several studios. I've written about the Glass Studio, the uh, Upper Metal um, Clay Studio. And uh, I think textiles I've written about, and, uh, and I'm going to read two pieces uh, that I wrote that I wrote here. You guys want to hear clay first? Clay? Where my clay people at? Makes noise with clay people. <laughs> right. Okay. Oh, come on, there's more clay people. Oh, there's got to be more. Let's hear it, guys. I see some dusty hands in here. Yeah. Molly, put on, make some noise. Okay. Let's see what happens. So this, uh, this piece is called Watch the Throne, and it's uh, inspired by Clay Studio. 
For thousands of years, human beings have thrown things. Ancient Greek Olympians threw javelin and discus. We throw coins into fountains, frisbees and baseballs. I teach at UNC where students throw parties and people drink until they throw up while watching athletes throw footballs. But here at Penland, I feel like a quarterback looking for safety. The minute I walk into the ceramic studio, you better duck because they love throwing things in there. <laughs> One man told me when his wife gets really, really mad at him, she throws things. All different types of things. She throws plates. She throws cups and bowls and vases, whatever she can get her hands on. But this is not domestic violence, see? This is domestic vibrancy. My friend Bobby Caddis told me he likes to throw things, too. He throws pots and mugs and sculptures until his fingernails are stuffed with clay like God's fingernails must have been when she first sculpted her son Adam from the dust here at Penland. Two hands and an open mind can transform the earth, literally transforming the earth beneath our feet by rotating at 360 degrees on a wheel much like the earth's axis. What power! The pottery studio at Penland is like Mount Olympus. I've watched the apprentices of Zeus reach into the earth and serve dinner on tectonic plates, carving fault lines into the earth's crust. They serve us a slice of life, fresh from the furnace, glazed and burnished. One man told me he quit his job as a banker. Exchanged earning pay and owning stocks so he could mold clay and throw pots. His latest piece is a gravestone. He sealed his past in a ceramic sarcophagus and ascended from the kiln like a clay phoenix, ready to exhume his soul from its tomb. He came to Penland so he could shape and mold his destiny. He studied under a Japanese emperor so he could surround himself with a thousand terracotta warriors. He dug into the experience, and now, years later, he appreciates the ability to throw having thrown himself into the experience at Penn. <laughs> so, uh, for the students, that was a list poem. <laughs> Uh, one of our assignments in the class is to write a list poem, and that's basically where you, where you learn, you try to get as many words as you can think of that relate to the thing, and then you, you write a poem based on that. So that's an example of a list poem. Um, this guy actually has an amazing list poem in his car, and I hope he goes and gets it. One second, please. All right, can we get it? It was great. It was great. Oh, Turner. Okay, so Turner. Turner, 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 when I, I didn't have an iPhone when I came to Finland, it was in a book, but since I've got an iPhone, I write all my poems on iPhone. No. Okay, Easter eggs. <clears throat> I was married on March 23rd, on a beautiful Easter Sunday, on the edge of a cliff overlooking the beach in Southern California. Children skipped and played around me and my new wife. We watched as they crawl between bushes and under rocks like little hermit crabs, searching for shells. And I noticed an egg in the grass by my feet. I picked it up and studied the egg. It was brown with faded yellow stripes on the side, and I thought to myself, what a concept. Easter is a deeply religious holiday meant to memorialize the ultimate sacrifice, brutal murder, and miraculous resurrection of a prophet. But many children believe in a different miracle, that a giant bunny went around the park laying Cadbury eggs for them to find. <laughs> At the time, I didn't realize it, but the children were not the only ones on a scavenger hunt that day. With a belly full of chocolate eggs, she wanted fertilized. My wife had hatched the plan. <laughs> and months later, our son Justice was born. <laughs> the very next year, I found myself again on Easter Sunday, staring down at my own little Easter egg. He was three months old, and... This was a very bad egg. It was already spoiled rotten. <laughs> Have you ever smelled rotten eggs on Easter Sunday? It's deceptive. At first glance, all you can see is the shell glistening like white china, and you wonder, what's inside? Perhaps caramel or organic chocolate wrapped in a soft cotton swab. Then you notice something peculiar. A 
crack in the porcelain prison. There's something terribly wrong here. You notice a greenish-yellow oak yolk oozing out of the cracks of the egg like magma. This volcano is so hot you can't get near it. One whiff will turn your nose hairs into charred matchsticks. It smells like 50 skunks in a sauna, Pepe Le Pew on steroids. These rotten eggs must have been laid by zombie chickens or a herd of bloodthirsty rabbit Easter bunnies. This is by far the most disgusting thing I've ever experienced. Justice, my son, made in my image, flesh of my flesh, your beautiful smile was alerted. To, it was a trick to lure me in, but now I see the truth. You are more foul than Judas, and my nostrils are being crucified. You've laid a basket full of rotten eggs and tucked them in your diaper. Now it's strapped around your soggy waist like a WWE championship belt. Carrots and broccoli, raisins and kale, mixed into a toxic elixir. One whiff and my eyes begin to flow like the Red Sea. I'm drowning in... Ugh. I took the diaper in my right hand and held him down with my left. He found this hilarious and started kicking his feet like he was running a marathon, as if on cue, his penis pointed directly at my face and fired like a sniper going for the kill. Not today, Easter Bunny. I dodged the attack and attempt to, I dodged the attack and attempt to move faster than his bowels. Wipes, smear, blot, regroup, breath, wipe, trash, fresh sniper, done. I threw his dirty omelet in the trash, washed my hands, and took a deep breath. Mission accomplished. <laughs> <laughs> now that's an offer. I heard a dude, I'll give you five bucks in the front row. We hear ten. <laughs> trying to bribe our students into expressing themselves. What a world. Uh, okay, I'll do a, I'll do one more uh, personal piece, and then I'll, I'll read another uh, piece about Penland, and then um, we're actually going to do a group piece with myself and some students and faculty from uh, Mitchell. So. Colleagues, get ready. Uh, okay, this next piece is called Captain America, and um, I always I encourage my students uh, really to write about things that they know a lot about, that they care a lot about, and um, I'm a huge, huge comic book fan. And does Woo! anybody? Yeah. yeah. Does anybody know the story of Captain America? For anybody in here who's not familiar, what what's like what's his backstory? Who knows? Anybody know? You want a Captain America fan? Anybody know? <laughs> Somebody in here has got to think it's Bruce, right? He's like a World War II guy and then he wakes up later and he's a superhero. So he's a superhero, but how did, did you know how he got his powers? No. Okay. So Captain America was like, oh, did, did you know? Were you about to say? He was a government experiment. You're absolutely right. He was a government experiment and he was just like a regular scrawny dude that uh, got something called the super serum. They injected him with the stuff that made him really big and really buff. And, uh, you know, I, I thought about that, about... The, the, the champion of, uh, of American justice with the shield and his flag really was just like a regular guy that was injected with a foreign substance and that's what made him the hero that we idolized. And uh, when I think about the history of America and how a superpower and the best country in the world, and I think about our, our past and our history with uh, you know, the indigenous people who were here and slavery, it's just really interesting what else went into the backstory of, of this country. So this piece is called Captain America. <clears throat> Somebody asked me the other day to describe what it's like to be black in America. I thought about it for a minute, and then I responded. Captain America. He may seem like a strange candidate to represent the black experience, but if you look at the biography of the character, you'll find a hidden heritage of America's embarrassment. On the surface, he's just red, white, and blue. Red blood, white skin, blue eyes, million-dollar smile. A champion of freedom, a defender of justice. But let me tell you about his background. Before he covered his face with a mask so he could breathe while others gasped on the poisonous fumes of his patriotism, before he ducked behind his shield, motionless like a statue claiming to uphold the statutes of liberty while actually he was frozen in a bronze cast, while the bronze skin were outcast as not second but third class citizens, a bronze cast. Before Sean Bell was given a military burial, 
Before Sean Bell was given a military burial, NYPD was too trigger happy for a 21 gun salute, so instead they wrapped his coffin in a star spangled banner and filled him with 50 shooting stars. Before he perpetuated the propaganda that peace is a delusion of grandeur, raising his tattered flag screaming, Avengers! Like the dim witted Boy Scout who didn't get the memo that the summer camp MO was supposed to be adventure. Before he was Captain America, he was a scrawny immigrant called Steve Rogers the spitting image of America's forefathers, who, much like Steve, immigrant settlers from Europe who claimed to discover this country were actually too weak to survive in America. They lacked the strength, knowledge, will, or stamina to thrive in this hemisphere, so they commandeered black bodies for a vicious experiment, extracted our souls, and made a super serum composed of black blood cells. You see all blood cells, but when blacks bled into southern soil, it produced unprecedented growth. It put American strength agility, speed, reflexes, and wealth on steroids, and transform 13 British colonies into one robust superpower. The process devoured black corpses, extracted remorseless resources, leaving us lifeless or brainwashed, and despite failed efforts from champions like the Black Panther, the super serum program remains intact today. America still pumps black heroes and heroin into her veins, addicted to performance-enhancing thugs. These days, they trap us in cellars. They trap us in cellars where we bleed and sweat for pennies on the dollar, making products that white sell, and it's ironic because it's so hard to get a job that many ex-felons end up becoming white sellers themselves. Selling white to black buyers, it's a vicious cycle like a red, white, and blue bike with sickles for handlebars. And if you're black, sickle sells. Sickle sells you a ticket to one way to move. Sickle sells you a one-way ticket down the highway to hell and the last stop is an American jail. This is the secret of the super serum, that we, you, me, are Captain America. We are the super soldiers and we only got two choices. Either live inside the syringe called prison feeding the American fiend or pledge allegiance to the streets of this despotic regime and pursuit of the American dream. Somebody asked me the other day to describe what it's like to be black in America. I thought about it for a minute and then I responded. Captain America. Click clack, Captain America. Click clack, Captain America. Click clack, Cat in America. <laughs> My last piece before I bring up my uh, colleagues from school. And uh, one, two. Um, a little backstory. This is about uh, upper. My first time in upper metal. And I wear jewelry, but I never really knew how it was made until I came to Penland. And um, it's really quite interesting. You go in there, and everybody's like clicking on stuff. It kind of sounds pretty cool. So uh, I'm going to try to replicate the soundscape that I heard when I first came into upper metal. the conductor. Music to my ears. Welding melodies with methodical precision, these musicians wield metallic instruments, sculpting copper and silver like a classical composer. Students, students write steel symphonies, and metal is the conductor. Slamming hammers into anvils like xylophones, creating notes and tones that send chills through my bones. I feel like I'm in a jazz club during the Harlem Renaissance. Artists are all around me, improvising, collaborating, and synthesizing, connected like the links in a chain, breathing life into brass like Coltrane. But instead of blowing saxophones, they hammer notes and tones out of cold stones, older than pterodactyl bones creating jewels of various hues. I've watched them bend wires like a guitar string, singing the blues with a pick and metal pliers. I'm inspired by the love. 
It seems like blacksmiths have just a little more iron in their blood. Whether you design rings that look like they were meant for Mayan kings or melt metal into golden streams as architectural structures emerge from your dreams, I love to listen when your hammer sings. Thank you so much. Um, I'd like to invite uh, all my Robin and the girl. students uh, who participated in the after-school program with us couldn't be here today. She works at McDonald's and she just couldn't get off work. Um, so we actually got her to record her portion of the performance. And if you don't mind, I'm just going to do a really quick sound check to make sure. I always wonder, why do you think? Okay. Do you think we should go with her? Yeah, yeah we should go with her. Okay. All righty. Um. All right. Um, so, uh, just a little bit of background about how this piece was written. Um, in addition to doing daily workshops with these wonderful uh, 11th graders in, um, in class uh, during this actual school day, we did an after-school program where uh, students of various mediums uh, and backgrounds and grades and faculty as well uh, came and we created a group piece that we're going to debut for you now. And, and it emerged out of a discussion. We just sat down around the table um, with some chocolate-covered uh, uh, plums, um, really good for your, you know, for your belly. Uh, and we talked about like what our life mantras were. And uh, this is what emerged out of that uh, conversation. Um, so please give a round of applause to our wonderful lady. Uh, we're going to have a quick group huddle. Caterpillar. A remarkable transformation has taken place in the life of an 18-year-old girl named Anna. The day of this transformation was the first Tuesday of the month of June. The school had just ended, and the salty tang of the ocean's breath settled on everyone's tongue. Minds were full of old endings and new beginnings. Everyone seemed quite cheerful, but the happiest of days can conceal that black film of evil. This evil unveils itself to Anna. She witnesses a broken love as his hand meets the girl's cheek in a thunder in a thunderclap of disguise and rage, disgust and rage. Anna, petrified, enters the dis disorienting world of choices. Her mind cannot form the words needed to save the girl from her torment. Her thoughts, in the form of vicious piranha, ate away at the ideas that formulated in her mind, except for one. If I hide halfway behind this oak tree and pray, maybe someone else will liberate the girl from her torment. The girl whispers for him to be quiet so people won't hear. But her plea only makes him talk louder. Anna realizes she was not the only one to notice. Why won't anyone help her? She asks someone close by. Enraged, Anna stomps her foot. Somebody do something. Somebody stop this. A strong, sure hand grips her shoulder tight. Julie looks into Anna's eyes. You're right. Someone should help. And you want to know something? You are someone. You have the ability to help that girl. You can be the hero of her day. Listen to your own voice and take control. Save her from her prison 
So be spectators that you can wipe slip of evil and make the surface clean again. Anna smiled, nodded in agreement. She shed her chrysalis, shook the waters from her wings, and spread them wide, enough standing on the sidelines of justice. <laughs> Have you ever been petrified, frozen stiff, bones like popsicles? I get that way sometimes when I hear someone say something cold-blooded. My heart freezes over and my hands begin to shake until they get numb, numb to the pain and the hurtful, piercing words. It's easier that way. When I hear something so biting, so bone-chilling that my tears freeze before they can spill from their wells, I get hypothermia. I shut down, first my body, then my mind. Like a mummy wrapped in snow, my silence is an icy sarcophagus. I bury myself in a cold grave, a fortress of solitude nestled in a lonely glacier, if only, oh, sorry, nestled in a lonely gl glacier. But if a cold person can drive an ice pick through your heart, maybe warm words can help you defrost. What, what does it take to, pick a, to make a stand, to speak out, to thaw off and get mad, to stop being so dang cool and get hot? When you hear something that makes you shiver, why not melt that cold remark with a warm smile? Massage those cold shoulders with boulders of hot coal. Breathe fire like a dragon and let your wings fan the flames of friendliness. Vomit volumes of liquid hot love like a benevolent volcano. All you have to do is ignite a conversation. I've had enough of the cold. <laughs> When I was little, my love bloomed thick and fast. I loved stories and dinosaurs and ancient Egypt. Later, medieval nights and fantasy games. Then all that went quiet, drowned in demands, buried by my need to please <coughs> you who teach me to read and calculate and fill in the bubbles. Everything I learned in a year, thought, discovered, hoped in a year, compressed into tiny leaden bubbles, fed through machine, filed away by percentile. By this you measured me, even as the marks for my height on the wall tracked upward. All my mind time, defined by the educational party line, there went my dream time, my me time, my free time, my teeth grind. What I love then is faint. The trail of love leading to love leading to love that I followed back then has led me into a trackless wasteland of homework and papers, timed essays, and textbooks. Numb to what I love, you leash me completely to please you who teach me. Please myself, what's that? I forget how. Know myself, no time, I forget now. What I love has been crushed to death. How will I find it? Looking for it is like panning for gold. Scanning the silt of my buried soul, scooping and shuffling it in clear water, scanning for that glint of light, that hint of shine, that scattered wit of mine. Slowly I gather the flakes of dust, dreaming of the nugget of my true me to wash free from what you need. I've had enough of what you need. <laughs> by the hundreds. They are the one percent. I am the ninety-nine. We ladies are the fifty-two. And you? In the U.S. we give a hundred and ten percent. But what do we take to get there? Karahachi Boo says eighty percent will do. Give ten percent, ten twenty, if you're lucky. But God, only she knows. Sequester cuts on defense up 10% and 4% for student loans. Credit card rates of 19.8. New cars? Zero if Equifax says you have the greenback. But as much as 4.10% if Experian says you don't meet the criteria.
Hmm. Maybe I should keep the Subaru. Christmas tree, the EOC, and still make a 73? Holy cow! Can that really be? Are these numbers all that people see? Do they really say enough about you and me? This poem is inspired by a fortune that I got in a cookie many years ago, and the fortune was, enough is as good as a feast. We have enough, we've had enough, enough to get by, enough to share, enough to spare, enough for everyone, good enough, smart enough, tough enough, courageous enough, lucky enough. Oddly enough, it's never enough. Enough already. Old enough to know better. Enough to drive you crazy. Enough is enough. Don't make me pull this car over. <laughs> <laughs> These words are from our student, Selena. I always wonder, why do some people get sad? Pero yo me pongo a pensar. Yo también huyo del mal que me enoja, buscando el bien que me falta. I do escape from the wrong that angers me, looking for the will I need. But then I just start to think about stuff, and I see stuff more clear. Because más que las penas que me duelen, las esperanzas, pero yo me digo sola, I can't fix that, be a better person, not the girl I am right now. I want to see something different too, but I can't, because I'm afraid. And if you're asking yourself, afraid of what? I really don't know of what I am afraid. Maybe afraid de que todo mis deseos contra los muros del habla rompan sus olas. Me sigan los tumultos que levantan esos, es, ese nido en el mar. That it can't blind me. I can't do it because my hopes do hurt me. That I will hurt myself even more. Pero la flor que lucha en el agua me sostiene más adentro. The flower that fights in the water sustains me in the deep sea. Y más afuera me lanza al cielo los ojos. Y miro tiempo that happened to me. Throws me out of the sea. I close my eyes and I look. The honor time that sings in my ear. But after that, I realize that I that the world is so pretty and God has something good for me. trying to understand things that are meant to be kept out of reach for mankind to digest. Why are we here? Where are we going? What is our purpose if we have one? And why has gravity chosen to hold us in one place, keeping us fighting amongst ourselves as brothers and sisters, all with the same blood and the same organ, pumping it through our veins? I've come to realize that I don't have all the answers, but I know why I get up in the morning. I get up because there's a chance that maybe today I'll make someone smile, and when they smile, I will smile because it's pretty contagious. I get up in the mornings because I have a hope that maybe there's a reality in a place where people, people have enough. They don't have more than enough that they have enough, and that's all we really need. I wake up because I have a passion, and because I have dreams to follow. I have dreams that need following. 
I am in love with music. And I think that when you have a passion and you follow it, then the world starts to make sense. Yep. It doesn't make sense now, but maybe it will if you start to follow your passion and your will. So once you follow your passion and the world starts to open up for you, the pursuit of happiness is no longer a pursuit, but it is right here. I want to live my life without a doubt in my mind. I want to stand up, stand up, stand up for what is right. And I won't have enough to throw away, but I'll have enough to get by. And together we've got a whole lot of time. And together we've got a whole lot of time. If anyone can uh, help me out with that, that'd be awesome. So um, I'm I'm going to I'm going to do just a, a something little, and then we're going to have Wes, which is pretty exciting. He's, he's my other favorite coworker. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you who the other one is. Um, so I need a little help for this though, because I have no rhythm. <laughs> Little fast. So let me start you out and then you're going to keep me going, okay? That was a really valiant start, though. But I, I didn't learn to rap between lunchtime and this evening like I promised some of you I would. So. Oh, I hate to disappoint him. Okay, if we can keep it there and not stand up, otherwise. I'll be busy. <laughs> I hate being busy. I love a mountain. I love a mountain. I love the mountain. Thou um for a while. I love I. Love, I 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 love, the highway. I love, love, I love, the highway. I love, the highway. I love, I love, I love, I love, I love, I love, I love I love I I love I love I love I love I love the ocean I love the whole ocean I love the ocean I will be Sleep here one day. I love, 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 I love
and out of sight and sound and other and song. I love the things and the feeling of life. I love this moment, this moment in the garden I will stay one day. <laughs> um, if you can just keep that applause rolling because your very own wet stitch. Oh. 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 He's looking very stylish tonight in a navy blue sweater and a leather jacket. I really want this guy to take me shopping. Did you? Did anyone witness the hat? the hat thing that happened today, well, they're setting up, I'm going to tell you a really funny story. So, like, about a year ago, I had, um, I had tea on Wes's back porch. He doesn't even live in that house anymore. You know, this is a long time ago. And um, he has his fedora, and I wanted to wear it. And Wes is a gentleman, and he will let you wear his fedora. He will. He's a sweetie pie. Yeah, I wore his fedora for nine months. <laughs> and, um, and so, finally, Wes shot me an email and said, um, is it ready to have my hat back? You know, if you don't mind bringing it to work, where we both go every day. Um, and so this morning I grabbed the first fedora out of my theater wardrobe. And, um, and I was so excited. And I went to West and um, I said, I have your hat. And I took it off my head and I put it on his head. And he looked at me like, this isn't my hat. It's such a much nicer hat than <laughs> So he's now wearing my Stetson as a collateral. <laughs> Moral of the story, if you lend something to me, I'll probably give you something nicer back. Lend me stuff. Are you ready? Yeah. Where would you stand? Where would you stand? What if I just sit? I'm just nervous. That's some fancy equipment, guys. Check, check. Okay, so um, I came up with this this afternoon, so be gentle. <laughs> Storyteller's trick <laughs> to begin with the end. So this is the end. This is how it begins. It begins with me. 
Set it on auto. of this box contained the warning that all that the love of money was the root of all evil the country which most proudly proclaims its trust in the box God has become consumed by the green-eyed currency hoarding it spending it stealing it conspiring for it and using the restriction of its flow to choke off the resources for those who cannot float in the economic current and have no access to the art of cash the leaders in this land of the bought and home of the soul, these captains of industries and slaves of controls, 
have used these limited edition reproductions and the numbers that represent them to line the walls of their museums of self-importance to block out the vision of those who have no presidential portraits of their own. This is the art of the 1% to control, to restrict, to hoard, and to rule. But we, the artists, those who speak in the vocabulary of dissent, we know the true power of the other 99. We, the artists, those who read the vocabulary of dissent and the stories that have gone before us, those who have paved the way in word, color, image, and song, we see that the story is truly being told. Because we, the creators of art, we understand that art only represents the visions which dance across the ballrooms of our minds, but can never fully encompass it. We realize that art is not the moon. It is but the finger pointing at the moon. As such, we understand where this current of money is pointing as well. For those collections of art, these folds of paper, these shekels, these coins, these glimmers of value, have for too long been idealized as value itself. But we, the artists of life, whose fabric of existence is woven with the word of truth, the vocabulary of dissent, we know that the art known as currency is not true value, but only a representation thereof. We are now seeing past this ruse and understanding these works of art as nothing more than playing cards with which they are gambling for our lives. For all of art, the intangible and the utilitarian is no more than a lie that points to truth, logos, the word. And because of this lie, we must shout the vocabulary of dissent. As the world around us quivers and shakes over the pending dissolution of the economies we have held so dear, as wars rage around us due to the unquenchable thirst for power, which tortures the poor souls who have none of their own, we, the artists, the proclaimers of the vocabulary of dissent and the representatives of the 99%, we know that we have a greater power within us. For we are the chosen ones, those who can see through the mist of mythology, break through the blockades of belief, relinquish the gallowed, recipe, the gallowed ropes of religion, and feel the word moving through us, coming out of us not only in red letters, but in every color of the rainbow, it is through this prism of expression that we write the world in the words in the vocabulary of dissent. Throughout the last revolution, as doubtful believers have dutifully followed the psychotropic musings of an island-dwelling artist by the name of John, his confounding revelation has given us a thousand years of the word in a box. But we, the artists of today, the prophets of the vocabulary of dissent. We know that it is within our power to write the prophecy that will lead us into the apocalypse we desire. Because we know, due to our connection with this word, the spirit of truth which transcends cultures, paradigms, stories, and religions which separate us. We know that we will lead the charge of this new revelation, and we will channel this flow into the new revolution. Revolutions are constant. They are fast and furious. They are slow and methodical. They are as constant as the earth moving around the sun and as tempestuous as a fad making its way through a middle school. Yet this revolution was not taught in schools. It will not be televised and it will not be stopped. Though the movers of money will try to block its flow, this revolution is fueled by a passion so hot it will turn the mountains of mula into cinder and keep right on moving. For this is the revolution of wisdom, and it is powered by the vocabulary of dissent. For we, the artists, the regulators of the vocabulary of dissent, we know the value of life, we feel the value of creativity, and we, we act upon the value of collaboration. We, the artists, the vocabulary of dissent, crying out in the wilderness, we understand the value of community. We realize the value of solitude. 
and we explore the ever-expanding stages of consciousness. We the artists, the realization of the vocabulary of descent, we already see that the streets are paved with gold. We have immediate and unrestricted access to a new heaven and earth. And we the artists hear the call of the goddess and the echoes of her muses. Yet we honor the Father for the direction he has given to us by pointing to his prod. We honor the mother for the comfort she brings us in the warmth of her womb and the unfoldment of her eternal lotus. And we realize our brotherhood with the son who spoke so loudly in the vocabulary of descent to point out the simple wisdom of loving the universal artists that we all know with our hearts, our minds, our strengths, and our souls. And through that unbreakable spiritual connection, we find the power to love our neighbors as ourselves. We, the artists, the painters of the vocabulary of descent, we know that the new revolution to which we are called and which we follow beckons us to continue the collaboration of creativity, to use the direction of the father, the support of the mother, the coaching of the son, to delegate the creation of the new heaven and the new earth we've been longing for. This is the vocabulary of descent. It is infused with the word logos, truth. We have the capacity to write the word. We have the power to see beyond the veil of illusions upon which the 1% play with their shadow puppets of horrors to hide our light from us. Beyond the limitation, our addiction to their card game has been placed upon us. We see the 12 steps to our freedoms. We recognize that our dependence upon their gambling has created a problem. It's hindered our abilities to fly as we know we are able. It has relegated us to the slavery, slavery of the machine. It has consigned us to lives far less glorious than those for which we have been created. By selling our time to their game instead of valuing our own time to make our own rules. But we, the artists, the writers of the vocabulary of descent, take our first step by recognizing we have a problem. Our second step is the recognition that a greater intelligence fuels us and calls us to something greater than the addiction which has kept us from the life that, our birth, that is our birthright. This is the vocabulary of the sin. Be free. Have faith. Give hope. Shine love. And write the world. Mark for sharing that with us. And I just want to take a, another quick moment to thank our Mitchell High students and teachers for being here with us tonight. Um, you know, I was, as, as Mark was reading, I was also thinking because I'm a chronic multitasker and uh, I was thinking about you guys because you read such fantastic stuff and you really are the next generation of, of all of the good stuff that happens around here. So thank you for driving up that windy old road to be with us tonight. And please don't stop writing because you guys are it. You're coming up after us and you're really special to us. And I'm looking at the two girls who haven't read anything yet. I think they might have three, yours, but, two, three, but can, we, can we have a hand for the next generation of people? <laughs> all of you for coming up because, like I said, you're so special to us. And um, and next, Indigo's behind me, isn't she? Yes. She's going to sneak up on me. <laughs> so we have Indigo. How do you, do you want to do this? Yeah. So um, we have Indigo and I have a slight mystery to solve. Um, does anyone go by the name of MG? I don't think so. So um, who's got the worst handwriting in the room? <laughs> okay, so you're number nine on the list. You're right before Sarah, right after Indigo. And if you signed up and I haven't talked to you yet, you might want to just come and inspect this. Okay. <laughs> All right, let's let's welcome Indigo here.
Um, I was going to do one of my own songs, but I need a capo for it and lost it when I was prancing around the field up there. So this is a song by Bright Eyes, and it's called The First Day of My Life. <laughs> First day of my life, I was born right in the doorway. When I was no red, everything changed. There's friends, but I can't so I'm Yours is the first day that I come. I thought I was blind before I met you. I thought it was strange that everything changed you. As if you just woke up. So I thought I'd let you know. But these things take forever and I essentially am so. But I realized that I need you And I wondered if I could down for mm. Remember the time you drove a night Just to meet me in the morning and I thought it was strange that everything changed you felt as if you just woke up. And I thought I'd let you know that these things take forever and I essentially am slow. But I'd rather be waiting for a paycheck than waiting to win the lottery. Ooh. Besides, maybe the time is different. I mean, I really think you like me. And this is the first day of my life. I swear I was born right in the doorway. When I was away, everything changed. They're spreading blankets on the beach. Yours is the first face that I saw. <laughs> you guys are awesome. <laughs> so I haven't solved the mystery. Is there a Meg in the house that is going to do this? Hey, oh. Sorry, I solved your handwriting, but I like your accordion. Okay, let's let's give Meg a real welcome. The real time. Paper is white, ink is black. Is this coming through? No, maybe I'll just skip it. Um, and my heart yearns after you. Thank you. 
explain to you later because I would like to take her home and have her live in my yard. <laughs> I would, I would give you little hats to wear. <laughs> Can we be friends? <laughs> wow. Okay. Wow. <laughs> so I have this idea, and it's that we just tell Jerry Jackson that he already okayed a regular open mic up here, and he just maybe forgot. <laughs> so the next time we all assemble, we'll just be like, what, Jerry? You said it was okay. The next one's at North Lake, though. The next one's at, yeah, okay. Uh, oh, yeah. oh, 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 Hi everyone, I'm Sarah. Hi Sarah. Hi Sarah. It's so awesome to be playing at the same stage as all these amazing people. Um, you're really awesome. Yeah. So I song about how Boys and girls are kind of the same, even though there's all these things that we think are really different. They're all pretty much the same. <laughs> Thank you. 
flabbergasted. <laughs> People think the only thing we know how to do is make moonshine. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Sam, are you ready? This is the man who makes your lunch and dinner every day. All right. <laughs> So this song's got to sing along. And it goes, row, row, row that boat. Row that boat from show to show. Live your life with work and then row your ass home back again. I don't know when it comes.
Okay. All right. Um, I'm going to speak for you a poem that um, one of many poems that I was introduced to this week by Paula Ferenson. And this is a poem by William Stafford. It's entitled, When I Met My Muse. I glanced at her, and I took my glasses off. They were still singing. They buzzed like a locust on the coffee table, and they ceased. Her voice belled forth, the sunlight bent. I felt the ceiling arch, and I knew the nails up there took a new grip on whatever they touched. I am your own way of looking at things, she said. When you allow me to live with you, every glance you take at the world around you will be a sort of salvation. And then, very slowly, I reached my hand out and I took her hand. special man. Yeah, he, he does that all day. He's just like, oh, see that? Here's a whole poem. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of what happens. When <laughs> <Paul's not singing. laughs> She's not exaggerating at all. So, um, finally, I just I want to thank you all for coming again. Um, thank you, Mark Boyd, for live streaming yes, us. Live streaming. <laughs> Hello, world. Hello, world from Penland, North Carolina. Um, and if anyone, after we're finished, would just like to ask Z if he needs help carrying anything, I'm sure that he would adore you and maybe even give you a cookie if he has any. Okay, he's not going to give you a cookie, but you'll still be a really great person. No, you you just, we just need to move the chairs over to the side of the room. That's all we need. We got okay. you. And let's, let's, uh, let's have a big, huge welcome to our closing act, Jacob. <laughs> This is a sing-along, so and, you know a lot of people. You might know it. It's sort of a traditional song. Um, so here it goes. As I went down to the river to pray, studying about that good old way. Now shall pray, star and crown, O oh Lord, show me the way. Oh, brothers, let's go down, let's go down, come on down. Oh, brothers, let's go down, down to the river to pray. As I went down to the river to pray, studying about that good old way now to shall Star and crown, O oh Lord, show me the way. O oh, sisters, let's go down, let's go down, come on down. O oh, sisters, let's go down, down to the river to pray. As I went down to the river to pray, Studying about that good old way, now who shall wear the star and crown, O oh Lord, show me the way. O oh, sisters, let's go down, let's go down, come on down. O oh, sisters, let's go down, down to the river to pray. As I went down 
to the river to pray, studying about that good old way. Now who shall wear the star and crown? Oh Lord, show me the way. Oh fathers, let's go down, let's go down, come on down. Oh fathers, let's go down, down to the river to pray. As I went down to the river to pray, studying about that good old way, now who shall wear the star and crown? Oh Lord, show me the way. Oh, mothers, let's go down, let's go down, come on down. Oh, mothers, let's go down, down to the river to pray. As I went down to the river to pray, studying about that good old way. Star and crown, oh Lord, show me the way. Oh sinners, let's go down, let's go down, come on down. Oh sinners, let's go down, down to the river to pray. say that it was probably really successful, and I uh, hope you guys enjoyed it, and thanks for tuning in and watching, and uh, I totally will have this one in the loop and in the archive, so um, we're going to wrap it up so I can break it quickly down, you guys take care, have a good evening, love you all, and uh, we'll see you Monday morning for Doc to now, and Tuesday evening for Air Occupy, thanks for tuning in.